COVID-19 infection in New York. So this is very real. This is affecting all of us. Uh, it affected our speaker schedule for today. Uh, so we uh, are very grateful to Dr. Kaleem Ahmed, uh, who has been a regular attendee here and one of our speakers before, who has kindly agreed to step in and provide a brief overview of updates on COVID-19 infections. Um, and um, in a minute, I will invite him to introduce himself and, and go for a presentation. And then after his short presentation, we will have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, and, uh, and then we'll start with Q&A uh, with the speaker and panelists taking those questions. Uh, again, uh, write any comments in chat box if you have. Uh, send your questions in Q&A. Raise your hand if you want a microphone. We invite all of you to be uh, participant as speakers and panelists. If you have experience with COVID-19 infection, you can send an email to apnamerit at gmail.com. You can also suggest other speakers who, do you who you think will be great speakers, and we can invite them uh, on your behalf, on Apna's behalf, to be a speaker in this platform uh, and then be a panelist with us. Uh, and we really greatly appreciate your involvement and your presence uh, early in the morning. So with that summarization, um, I will um, uh, invite our uh, speaker, Dr. Kaleem Ahmed, uh, to introduce himself and provide a brief overview of COVID-19 infection updates. Dr. Kaleem. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you, Danish. Uh, um, um, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, wonderful group uh, from across the continent. Very happy that when we talk to people, we are playing a role in such a project where the whole world is trying to understand this disease and treat it and it's trying to be a good thing. And we are trying to make a little bit of work किसी इंसान की किसी महले में लोगों की जान बचा ले तो वेरी थैंकफुल फॉर दिस पॉर्चुनिटी एस यू ऑलरेडी मेंशन दैट वी फील सॉरी फॉर आर लव वन इन द फैमिली हु डाइड बिकॉज़ ऑफ़ दिस कंडीशन सो यस इट इज़ अ रियल कंडीशन रियल इश्यूज एवरीबॉडी इज़ फेसिंग दिस टुडे व्हाट आई एम गोइंग टू uh, we have been learning uh, instead of teaching we have been learning since we started this project learning a lot uh, learning from our colleagues learning from friends with seminar and then studying to understand is better so uh, we have many different topics we covered almost every aspect of this uh, disease process and uh, some specialty issue some management issue today what i'm going to do uh, briefly is to share with you my uh, uh, little bit uh, understanding about this whole process in a summary. When we are talking about major management issue, we focus on a very small segment, which is very, very important, critical, life-saving, but then we take out our focus from uh, the whole disease process. I'm gonna give you a little brief, about 10, 15 minutes, uh, uh, brief overview of this condition, and then inshallah we'll open up the discussion as Danish has mentioned, and then uh, we're going to see how we could learn from that. So with that, let's start this. Uh, um, so the COVID-19, what exactly the COVID-19 stand for? So COVID-19 is basically a coronavirus uh, uh, disease, which was kind of started in 2019. That's the reason the disease related to this coronavirus, a novel coronavirus is called COVID-19. When we come to the virology, it's belong to coronavirus has a many different things. We could have a common cold. A lot of people uh, can develop this common cold kind of thing with the coronavirus thing. But then there are certain strains of the coronavirus as seen, uh, which was causing significant problem, uh, including the SARS, uh, uh, which was severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, which was very, very virulent and has caused a lot of problem. MERS, we have learned about that thing. Uh, and it also had a similar kind of issue. So the, this novel coronavirus is belong to the same subgenes of the SARS, but it has a different clade. It belongs to a different ancestor. We're still learning about that. And the similarity is that uh, this uh, coronavirus 
uses the same receptor of ACE2 receptor in respiratory epithelial cells for the entry. Uh, and because of that reason, International Committee for Toxinomy for the viruses has proposed that it should be called SARS-CoV-2, means similar thing as SARS with COVID coronavirus 2 because it has a little bit different than the SARS, but almost similar receptor. It's this, as in any virus, this is, uh, virus changes uh, strain a little bit here and there, about 130 strains so far uh, has been analyzed. Two distinct uh, variety, which is uh, subtype L and uh, S was uh, reported from China. Clinical significance of that uh, still we don't know, um, but that is what the virologists will decide about that. When it comes to the epidemiology, so far, uh, it's been reported uh, all over the world except Antarctica. So we have no reported cases so far from Antarctica. And uh, transmission is mainly, as we all discussed, it is from the respiratory droplet, ice, you know, like a flu. Um, droplet typically do not travel more than six feet. And uh, it does not linger on in the air too long. That is the reason the six feet distancing has been proposed from many different uh, governments and uh, regulatory agencies and the WHO and so forth and so forth. When they did the, some experimental modeling with the generation of the aerosol, they showed that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is remained viable in the environment uh, for at least for three hours. And this is the reason in certain condition, when there is a lot of aerosolization, the recommendation from different societies and guideline is that one should be very well protected with PPE, including N95 mask. So the reason is because those aerosolization could be uh, you know, a reason for infection for other people. As for WHO and China joint report, uh, there is no fecal oral transmission to, has been uh, suggested for the significant uh, disease uh, propagation. Although the viruses has been found in the stool, but infectivity was not documented. There was no viruses found in the, in the urine uh, uh, per se. How long this virus uh, is uh, remain infective? So uh, throughout the course of the disease process, the, the viral RNA um, has a different uh, kind of uh, um, um, the way its, uh, its infectivity changes. Uh, and uh, during the first week, uh, it was found to be more uh, infective than the rest of the time. So infectious viruses are readily, uh, you know, recognized by this uh, technique of uh, uh, RNA detection with the nasopharyngeal swab. And during the first week, uh, they found that you can uh, isolate those viruses which have effective property. But after that, although the virus is still there, but uh, they are not as infective as during the first phase. And they have done some studies published in Nature. They found that the viral replication RNA and its intermediates were reported in the throat swab, but uh, they were not as infective. So these inf information might be important in future understanding of our different policies and procedures and how to implement those scientific information into practicality. Uh, when we look into the uh, epidemiology uh, related to this, uh, um, the duration of viral shedding. So many different studies you can see which is available. And there is a timeline between eight to 37 days. A median duration uh, was proposed about 20 days. Uh, that was a study published in the Lancet. But uh, in another study, it was shown that more than 90% uh, patients who are previously infected with the COVID-19 
after 10 days of the onset of the symptom, they became negative. And uh, in um, one study where they did the quantitative analysis, again, this was published in Nature, that if the, the viral RNA copies are less than 10 to the power six, uh, then it does not produce uh, any significant infection. Again, this is uh, scientific data, uh, clinical implication probably is going to be in future, but not right now. Risk of transmission of the disease, as we all know, um, is uh, most commonly uh, when we're talking about in, in any kind of society level, like so most commonly it has seen, and again from the China study, the most uh, uh, you know, information we have from there is from the household contact. So the household contact uh, in the early stages of the disease was about 10% in China. Later on, it was in other part of the world, like in Italy and Spain, and even in the United States, it was dropped down to between 1% to 5%. What is the risk? A lot of time people, uh, you know, we all healthcare provider, we uh, have patient, they ask question. So what is the risk of transmission from indirect contact? What is indirect contact? It means if somebody is walking to the grocery store or uh, walking on a street and somebody's passing who has been diagnosed to have coronavirus, just by passing through this, handling the item, somebody is delivering uh, food to you, or a package coming to your house, what are the risks of handling those things? So those risks are, it has not been documented that much and it is suggested that it is probably very low. The another thing which we all wanted to know is uh, uh, how we can develop immunity. So, so far what we know about this is, uh, it's take about uh, 14 days, uh, to develop uh, the IgG in the system. Close to about three to five days timeline has been seen in some studies to appearance of the IgM and IgA. Um, incubation period as, uh, is about 14 days from the time of the context. So that's the reason most of the time, initially we were uh, ask, asking patient to, who has contact to go for self-quarantine. Uh, uh, the self-quarantine and self-isolation, these are the two terms used, and sometimes people use it synonymously. I just want to clarify that self-quarantine is that if you are suspected that you are in contact with somebody who has COVID-19, and you are not sure, you don't have any symptoms, so you keep yourself away from other people, distance six feet, and not you know, trying to go out too much. That's called self-quarantine. Self-isolation is that if you are positive, but you don't have symptoms, you don't have to go to the hospital, then you need to isolate yourself. Then you have to you know, change your lifestyle. You separate separate So all these things are part of the self uh, uh, isolation, which is slightly different from the self-quarantine. Spectrum of the illness and severity. So this is an important thing which I want to stress. So far, whatever we studies have come to us, if we slice and dice it in different ways, we slice and dice it in different ways, then there is a number that comes to us. 81% patient who was diagnosed to have uh, this coronavirus they have either no symptom or they have mild symptom or mild kind of symptom, which is maybe a little pneumonia or not. And then about 14% of the patient has severe symptom and severe symptom is defined by like somebody is developing significant pneumonia or hypoxia. And pneumonia is involving more than 50% of the uh, structure on the ch chest radiograph. And only about 5% people are critically ill. Those patients who either develop respiratory failure, shock, or multi-organ failure. So if you take in, in journal, this is what we are dealing with. About 5% of those vulnerable 
population is going to require our expertise in taking care of those patients uh, when they are going to be in very, very sick. But 95% of the patient population either going to not require ICU and ICU care, or they're going to require some other form of care which we could provide uh, with the understanding of this disease process. Case fatality rate of this disease uh, uh, is anywhere between you know, 0.7% to 5.8%, depending upon which data, data you're looking. In close to 2.3% uh, uh, was initially reported in China in, in, and uh, where the disease was started in Wuhan. But in overall in China, it was 1.4%. Uh, so again, fatality, although it is much higher than seasonal flu, which is 0.1%, but this is some number which we need to keep in mind. Then we already know that there are many risk factors uh, for the severe illnesses and you know, comorbidity, which we call diabetes, coronary artery disease, uh, COPD, asthma, cancer, chronic kidney disease, you know, advanced age, uh, uh, and obesity. So, and people who have seen these people who are going through the severe process, about, you know, two to three comorbidities there, they're, they are kind of in it, uh, at a higher risk of developing uh, problem. The median age for hospitalized patient, uh, again, hospitalization on the basis of the need for hospitalization. And Pakistan, as we heard yesterday, they are admitting patients who may, may or may not require hospitalization. So, uh, so those patients was between the age of 49 to 56. Uh, people who are developing in a severe critical illness, there are certain lab findings which are jumping out, including lymphopenia, in some cases uh, lymphocytosis, but primarily lymphopenia, increased LDH, liver enzyme, some inflammatory markers like CRP and ferritin, and D-dimers. There's also increase in uh, PT, prothrombin time, uh, troponin, some increase in the CPK and development of the acute uh, real failure. These are the things which were seen uh, in few studies published in JAMA. In US, what we have seen, about 67% uh, of the cases uh, who are admitted in the hospital was more than 45 years old. So a little bit younger population was more than what we have seen in China and in Italy. But 80% of the death occur uh, in US uh, was uh, in patient population who were more than 65 year old. Asymptomatic uh, patient uh, with infection. So this is another thing which we have to uh, keep in mind. There are patients who are going to be totally asymptomatic. As I said earlier, 81% has a mild symptom or, uh, or no symptom. The best data which we have uh, in a confined environment is uh, Diamond Princess Cruise. You know, everybody heard about that. There's a cruise line where infection was started in Japan and, and that was a perfect case study. So out of that, about 17% of the patient, uh, people who are on board were tested positive for COVID-19. But only 50% out of that, which is about 619 confirmed positive patient, they were asymptomatic. They had no symptom at all, despite being positive in a confined environment. And then the same thing is, uh, even in the, uh, the, the very first uh, uh, you know, large group of patients was involved in Seattle, in King County, Washington, to Seattle nursing home, there was 13 patients out of 23 total positive uh, were asymptomatic uh, in, initially when they were uh, tested, uh, but later on there are some uh, more patients uh, who are asymptomatic. They become symptomatic later on. Interestingly, uh, when we have seen the CT radiographic data, even patients who are asymptomatic, they could have, in up to fifty percent of the time, they could have some type of radiological abnormality 
uh, in the CAT scan. So, uh, so these are the things which I want to, you know, um, make sure that we can cover this thing in the journal and then go from there. Symptom wise, the majority of the time, the symptom which we have seen is temperature, uh, fever more than 104, about 99% of the time, this is China data. Fatigue was about 70% of the patient. Dry cough was noted in about 59% of the cases. Anorexia in about 40%, same with around myalgia, 35%. And shortness of breath in about 31% of the patient. And there are, you know, we know that the cough is primarily dry cough, but in about 20% of the cases uh, uh, in one study in the JAMA, um, shows that they could have sputum production. And also GI symptom like uh, nausea and diarrhea was also seen in about 18% of the patient population. So first time we have seen some studies from Italy where they have also seen the uh, anosmia and the dysfunction taste uh, um, in about 30, 34% of the patient population. When the disease progress, the course of complication happened that dyspnea usually occur um, about fifth day after the start of the initial symptom. So suppose somebody has contacted this and then start developing some fever and cough, but the shortness of breath could be the later part of the disease process rather than very immediate symptoms. And then people who develop progressively uh, to the worsening of the symptom, they are usually occurring in between seven to eight days. But the problem which we have seen all over that once they develop the shortness of breath and those patients who unfortunately develop uh, worsening of the respiratory failure, it happened very quickly, either development of ARDS or other uh, respiratory abnormality. And um, in some studies, Initially, when it was, we were uh, reviewing this thing, we thought that so everybody is developing ARDS, but then we have seen that there's another form of uh, respiratory abnormality, which is not pure ARDS kind of typical picture, some other complication. Uh, and then ARDS kind of thing is now ranging between 12 to 40% in hospitalized patients with it uh, seen. Other complication, as you might have heard from our uh, cardiology colleague and our nephrology colleagues, that arrhythmias has been seen in about 17% of the time, myocardial injury with the positive troponin MI occurring about 7% of the time, and shock uh, circuitry failure about 9% of the time. Again, these data was, you know, there's so many data from different publications. Um, I'm giving you some few of them here. And uh, in about 33% uh, uh, of the people in the US uh, in one study, who are severely ill in uh, respiratory failure in critical care uh, ICU ventilated, about 33% of them has some cardiomyopathy as well. Pulmonary embolism and stroke was also reported. And then this microvascular uh, thrombosis, some DIC picture and uh, DIC or microthrombic related uh, complication of multi organ failure was also seen. So recovery time from the disease in journal is about two weeks from, uh, from the start to the finish in patient who has mild symptom. People who develop more severe and serious condition, it could be around uh, three to six weeks. And radiographic imaging is all over the place. If you read the American Radiological Society guideline, although there is a classical picture is consolidation, subpleural distribution, ground glass changes, halo sign, uh, crazy paving, all those kinds of things are classical, but uh, they suggest that even if some patient, you may not see any kind of uh, radiographic changes, but don't rule out that. Take the patient in, 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 uh, in, a, in journal. Um, and diagnosis, again, uh, by the RT-PCR, nasopharyngeal swab is the best, uh, but uh, it could be negative uh, in about 30% of the time, depending upon when you're doing it, how you're doing it. Um, if somebody's intubated, uh, BAL should be done. Expectoration for the sputum should not be done because of, again, aerosolization issues. 
but if somebody is coughing up phlegm, then you can use a sputum. Swap could be performed oropharyngeally as well. Nasal swap could be done, um, but uh, the yield of that is variable uh, in different patient population. Um, if you do BAL, the sensitivity is uh, close to 95% uh, in those patients. A lot of people are, uh, you know, hoping to have a point of care uh, serological test. Uh, the serological test kits which are available are kind of their uh, effectiveness is all over. Uh, WHO is not uh, endorsing any. FDA has approved several. Um, but again, the accuracy is still in question. Unless we have more data, it's going to be difficult. And uh, management-wise, uh, how to deal with that? So in more than 81% who are mild cases, we just have to do either symptomatic therapy or no therapy, except for uh, self-isolation. Uh, uh, um, if patient develop a severe uh, infection, again, there is no concrete evidence. There's a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials going on, and people are using uh, different institution had different protocols. So you follow your institution protocol, either using hydroxychloroquine alone in combination with azithromycin. Although there's a recent publication which is you know discouraging using both together, especially because of the heart issue and QT prolongation problem. Remdesivir uh, has been showing some progress uh, and uh, promise. Again, it is still an investigative uh, medication and uh, you should use uh, uh, according to your own hospital guideline. Um, convalescent plasma, again, is something is that uh, uh, this is again an experimental thing. Um, IL-6 uh, inhibitor, uh, uh, TOSI and others, uh, uh, and uh, steroid, um, you know, again, we have talked about that in detail on those things. We could handle this thing in question and answer session. Mechanical ventilation, how are we going to do that? We have a, a robust discussion about that, and we're going to, inshallah, uh, doing the ventilator course as well. So we're going to um, uh, talk about that and guide accordingly. So this is just a little brief summary, and I'm going to stop here, and then, to, inshallah, uh, we're going to start our discussion, and if I or other panelists, uh, uh, please jump in, and then we go from there. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaleem, for a very concise and wonderful summary. Uh, I want to uh, request attendees again. Uh, for someone like me who is joining after a few days, it would be great if you can introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, I promise I read every single introduction and hopefully remember most of them. Uh, welcome to the webinar and discussion platform. Please use the Q&A box to ask your questions from the speaker, from the group of panelists who will introduce themselves in a minute here. I do have a bunch of questions already to begin with. I also want to tell the panelists, uh, to the attendees, that we have, we are doing a poll right now that you should see pop up on your screen where we're trying to figure out how to adapt our webinar in, during the Ramadan timing. Uh, I appreciate if you can give your answers here and then hopefully we can also send this poll out to all our subscribers and registered participants. Um, Dr. Kaleem briefly mentioned that we are working on figuring out if we can develop a basic ventilator management course for our participant, you will see a simple survey come in your email uh, to ask this question and please respond to those. Based on your response, we'll decide uh, if we can put something together, how useful it will be, or if we can find something that's already going on for you guys for ventilator management. Uh, and then, uh, before I start with the Q&A today, let me go one by one to our panelists uh, and ask them to introduce themselves. Um, I will call your name. Please uh, unmute yourself and then introduce yourself and leave me and then I will get to the questions afterwards. So uh, I will go alphabetically. Dr. Farhan Kadir. Uh, Assalamu alaikum ji. My name is Farhan. I am a nephrologist. And I am a critical care 
यूसीएमसी में कर रहा हूँ थैंक यू डॉक्टर मरियम मोटिन Assalamualaikum. I'm Maryam Morton. I'm a staff cardiologist at Loma Linda VA in California. Dr. Muhammad Salim. Assalamualaikum, Janab. I'm Dr. Muhammad Salim Khan. I'm working as chief consultant physician in Kotli, Azad Jammu and Kashmir. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Salim. It's a pleasure having you. डॉक्टर कबानी योर वॉइस इज नॉट कमिंग अक्रॉस प्रॉब्लम इज अ माइक्रोफोन इशू यस Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I I was saying that uh, this is Dr. Kabani from Houston, and I'm a pulmonary critical care physician, uh, and work also as a tele intensivist. Thank you, Professor Shamsa Humayu. Dr. Humayu, please unmute yourself. Assalamualaikum. Yeah, I am Dr. Shamsa Humayu. I am professor and head of kind department at Fatma Ina Medical University, Sargangaram Hospital, Lahore. Dr. Rosina Munir. Dr. Munir, please unmute yourself. Ji, please introduce yourself. Okay, we're having trouble hearing Dr. Rosina Munir. So let me go ahead and start with the questions. And remember, if you uh, have any comment that you want to make and want a microphone, then please uh, raise your hand, and I will come to you. Uh, time permits as soon as I can. and please write to us if you want to be included in the panelist or if you want to be a speaker or suggest a speaker to us so uh, dr kareem uh, one of the themes uh, let me come to a easy question because that's something that was discussed recently by our residents too and the question was how to use tools between patients uh, so uh, the question is about using stethoscope between patients in opd and for our resident it was about using a reflex hammer when you're doing inpatient rounds or if you're seeing a covid infected patient so what's your thought and then i'll come to panelists afterwards so uh, what we are doing it uh, we in our institution we try to minimize if we are going to the covid patient room we are uh, using disposable stethoscope so it's a 1 dollar stethoscope uh, available outside after you uh, put your ppe and before entering you take the cells go put in the ears and then you go into the room after you examine the patient you come out and uh, throw that thing now uh, it's not possible in pakistan so the best way of dealing with is to clean your stethoscope and keep that thing in the ward the studies which was done in terms of uh, uh looking at the viability of the uh, uh sarcovi 2 uh, on the surfaces is uh, like hand washing or yahan par ya use karte hain zyada tar jo hand sanitizers hain jo ke 62% to 71% alcohol based after one minute of that uh hand sanitizer the viability of covid uh, 19 is gone so if you use there is a cdc and who has a whole list of uh, different disinfectant which is available uh, in different countries so hum unko usi ko lekar hum apne stethoscope ko saaf kar le aur dusre equipment agar hame use karna hai to um, hammers or dusri cheeze if the neurologists are using it i think they can do the same thing but a concept jo bahut hi clear hai minimize patient interaction 
spending time, especially with people who are, uh, we, if you don't want to do any specific procedure, especially in the ICU setting when the patient is on ventilator and then there's chances of aerosolization, try to minimize that. Okay, panelists have any comments? I agree with Dr. what Dr. Kaleem just said. Uh, just minimize contact and be extra careful. Uh, I, st I heard a statement from somebody: keep your stethoscope in your pocket if you can, you know. But uh, <laughs> if any, but, but I don't know if we can always do that. <laughs> you know, uh, I just want to add a caveat. Right, right. A lot of time, you know, we are pulmonary critical care doctors. Mm -hmm. And outpatient, I have outpatient practice as well. So there we are doing telemedicine and not examining the patient. And one of my colleagues was saying, you know, it's a kind of, uh, I'm able to get to the bottom of most of the patient. Uh, some people I feel that I should examine, but most of them I can, and I can help them out without even listening. So, you know, we should learn from these things. Although I'm not minimizing examination, I'm just telling you what we are experiencing. Very good. Uh, so next question, a couple of different people have asked, and I'm just lumping them together, is about uh, early signs and symptoms of COVID-19 infection. You know, we know about upper respiratory tract illness and fever, uh, some discussion about anosmia. Um, there is question about lymphopenia. Are there such uh, signs that we can look at to uh, to worry about COVID-19 infection beside a respiratory tract infection, Dr. Kaleem? Um, again, I think that those things, there are some uh, upper respiratory tract symptoms, uh, which is in which you have a dry cough, hai, uh, scratchiness of the throat, hai, systemic manifestation in which you have a fever, hai, these are the two things that are more common, along with systemic manifestation of myalgia. Um, and, uh, but uh, the other non-typical presentation, uh, including nausea or just what you said, that anosmia or taste ka jo issue hai, ke kuch logo ke inda jo hai, tak when 34% of logo ke inda jo hai, anosmia or taste jo hai, wo Italy mein dekha gaya hai. Saat si saat jo hai, wo diarrhea ke saat jo hai, uh, about 18% of the population just present with diarrhea. In fact, in one of uh, a patient in our institution uh, was the sole symptoms of fever along with very excessive diarrhea. And he was uh, on the floor in fifth day, crashes, developed into severe respiratory failure, you know, shock, uh, intubated, presses, all this kind of thing. You know, within four or five hours from starting having shortness of breath and going to that direction. So there the are multiple, you know, um, kind of uh, um, symptom or uh, systemic symptoms are there, but these are the most common which we have seen. Um, lymphopenia is there, but again, those are the patients who are hospitalized and has symptom. I'm not sure about somebody who is asymptomatic uh, or has a very mild symptom, uh, we should be looking for these uh, markers. The one study which was seen as the prognostic uh, indicator, uh, again, uh, published in JAMA, coming from China, is uh, uh, sequential you know, changes in the lab values of uh, your electric dehydrogenase, uh, D-dimers, uh, and uh, uh, other marker, including CRP, ferritin level. Uh, and then if it's constantly going up, then that is directly related to the poor outcome. Farhan, you had a comment? Gee, I have a but these days, actually, patients are presenting with different complications. I have a couple of patients who actually presented with altered mental status. And Danish Bay, you're a neurologist, so you probably can tell me better. But I have seen them having strokes. I have seen them having encephalopathy. I've seen them having the, a couple of my patients actually has word occlusions. Um, though presenting with ultimate status, I have recently one patient with COVID positive. The initial presentation was completely seizures. Uh, so yes, the most common, but 
you cannot rule out completely neurological symptoms as a part of um, presentation as well, though it's weird. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, uh, thank you, Fran. Uh, I think this is, uh, we all learning that. I, uh, my uh, nephew who works in uh, uh, ER, he encountered three days ago a patient who presented like a DKA. Uh, coming here, a little short of breath, uh, pH was 7.07 .07 range, glucose up, uh, um, decreased urine output, uh, and suddenly collapse. Uh, so, you know, uh, many, uh, and then intravascular microthrombus uh, related uh, kidney failure, uh, there's a stroke kind of thing. Uh, it has been reported, absolutely. Uh, any other panelists any, has any comment? And you can also raise your hand and that will make me uh, easy for you to call you out specifically for your comment. But anyone wants to add to early signs and symptoms of COVID-19? No, I just wanted to say that the uh, anosmia is also supposedly due to the neurotropic uh, mechanism of the virus. So uh, definitely a issue with neurological manifestations that we have also seen. Are you able to hear me now? I'm, yes, I'm just making sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I saw a, a publication today uh, about... Um, redness and pain in distal uh, foot toes as an early presentation of uh, COVID-19 infection by a dermatology group. So is, I think there's so many varied presentations. Um, I will move on to another theme of multiple questions uh, and group them together, uh, which is related to testing. So questions are, for example, um, how many days it take for the COVID test to become positive? What if the initial test is negative? When you should repeat it if you are suspicious? Uh, why it takes uh, so long to get sometimes positive two or three attempts? How good is COVID virus testing? And what many, you know, what different types of testing are available and which one to rely on? So Dr. Kaleem, let's start with you. Um, well, um, I think we are discussing this uh, uh, kind of, uh, almost daily basis, uh, but I think it's always good to recap. The The best test which we have is the PCR, uh, RT-PCR uh, test, uh, and the, um, the timeline uh, is most of the time, uh, the test RT-PCR is positive um, within first five, or first one, first week of initial contact. And during the first week, the virus load in the upper airway is much higher compared to the second and third week. Um, so if the nasopharyngeal uh, swab, uh, RT-PCR, is not available, because sometimes swab, you know, the, the nasal swab stick is a short supply in some, some places. So they have uh, oral uh, oropharyngeal swab, that could be done. The problem is, that it's initiated gag reflex and it is problematic for patient. Sometimes you have to manipulate it as one of our panelists was uh, discussing the other day that about 10 seconds, you have to rub that area. Uh, I've not seen that myself uh, in, in data, but I rely on the information. Um, then there are testing which you could do from the nasal uh, cavity passage. Uh, again, if you don't have a big, uh, uh, you could use the Q-tip and in, in, uh, in between the turbinates, you could take the swab from there. And uh, also um, there are nasal swab, which is from the nares from both sides, you can take it. If somebody is coughing up uh, phlegm, uh, you, can, you should try to take it from the sputum, but don't induce it. Um, if somebody is intubated, then using the BAL is the best uh, uh, sensitivity so far about 95 percent. Rest of the test is about 60, anywhere between 45 to 71 percent type of range. Uh, nasopharyngeal is among the best. How about serology for antibody? So serology, they have done uh, serology uh, in some studies. They have combined the RT-PCR and serology and have they seen the uh, the sensitivity goes up to 80 percent plus. 
the IgA and IgG, uh, IgA and IgM uh, usually start coming into the um, the body uh, in about five days or so, and IgGs take about fourteen days uh, to come into the system after the exposure of the uh, disease process. So, again, uh, it's good tool uh, to um, have it on hand if it is accurate. Uh, so far. Uh, we are not giving green light from uh, World Health Organization in terms of their accuracy. Yesterday, I was reading an article about the serological testing, which is England has ordered uh, millions of dollars of that, and they are not utilizing because the accuracy is in question. Farhan, you have a comment? Uh, Dr. Farhan, uh, unmute yourself. Sorry. Assalamu alaikum. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Kaleem has just talked about it. I believe personally that the, one of the reasons that our test sensitivity is a little low, it depends on the collection. It depends on the phase when you're actually collecting it, whether you're doing it in the viral replication phase. Because sometimes when the patient comes in our ICU, they kind of pass this viral replication phase and they're actually in cytokine storm. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And the third thing is, which is very important, in most of the places, they're talking about two tests so that before they can even take out the droplets, so that actually adding on two tests can take your sensitivity close to 80%. The third thing when I was reading the comments, they were talking about that there is a patient who actually had four tests and the fifth come back positive. I have not seen it personally, but I can tell you that if your fifth test is positive, my high suspicion is not that the patient came positive as a, as a, uh, as a COVID, but actually end up getting COVID in the hospital, which we have seen with our other infections like the rhinovirus and all that stuff. And I have personally had patients with negative rhinovirus to RVP and then end up coming back positive rhinovirus while in the hospital for 14 days. So I believe that's the answer to the one of the questions which I read. Um, that's, that's what my thinking is. In terms of antibody testing, again, strongly believe that the IgM and IgG, they are very important. Um, adding them on in future would be a good idea to look for the herd immunity. And I think this is gonna help us to open up the country at the same time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Salim, you have a comment? Yeah, do viral antigens have any role in the diagnosis? As far as I know, we haven't seen antigen testing. We have PCR, which probably is for the yeah. RNA. And then we have the serology for antibodies, but not a direct yeah. antigen titer or antigen detection in some shape or form. Yeah, I, I also have another question. Uh, how often you encounter hyperglycemia in uh, normoglycemic COVID patient? Because theoretically speaking, that there is increased surge of counter-regulatory hormones and cytokines like interleukin-1 and TNF, which increase gluconeogenesis, and there is decreased insulin release from the pancreas and also there is increased insulin resistance. So how often you encounter hyperglycemia in these normoglycemic COVID patients? You know, Dr. Um, I will um, you know, pass this to other panelists. Uh, I have not seen that many number of patients uh, um, in our critical care. Uh, so um, I will rely on other people who has my have larger exposure uh, to the we, patient. We, I, I haven't seen that many either. We see, of course, hyperglycemia in patients that are already diabetics and the diabetes normally under control can get out of control due to the infection. But I, I don't recall, but we can certainly do a, a literature search and look for it. I'm sure like we are seeing everything with COVID, we might even have been seeing this, you know. So I will reserve my answer for that until I have a chance to look at it. Farhan, you have a comment? Yes. Uh, so if you look at the data based on uh, the first paper came out from China, 
there was some talk about that the patient has hyperglycemia, but it's not different from any group of patients based on that one paper. There's not different from any group of patients uh, which are actually like previous group of patients with arts, with sickness, with septics, uh, septic shock, where you can have some hyperglycemia, even a normal glycemic patient with the mechanism you described. And uh, though does that hyperglycemia does has impact on mortality or ICU mortality as we bet in our other patients? I have no idea about that. I, but I believe, as you said, patient with a cytokine storm can cause pancreatitis, can decrease insulin release, can cause insulin resistance, like in any other patient. And I do not believe that we change our practice. We still have the same ICU protocol to treat hyperglycemia and keep it between 140 to 180 in my ICU. Thank you. So sticking with the same theme of uh, early presentation and diagnosis, a couple of questions are uh, related to the fever. Um, so if someone is having fever, what patterns are we expecting? So there's a question specifically about uh, on and off fever, fever coming and going, and not a persistent fever. Uh, and then uh, in a, how to differentiate it from fevers from other causes, Dr. Kaleem? Well, it's going to be uh, different causes going to be Difficult, definitely. We know that there are uh, in different, depending upon where environment you are in, um, there are other uh, superimposed infection could happen, co viral infection could happen. Um, majority of the patient in COVID, according to the literature, they have temperature more than 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degree Fahrenheit, uh, but uh, in addition to that, there are some cases where they are positive patient with other symptoms, but their temperature is not uh, hovering at that level. In fact, there are some patient who has uh, less than that and uh, 99, 98.6 plus. So, but those are not the highest number of the patient population. Um, if somebody has any focal sign uh, of uh, any other infection, uh, apart from respiratory tract, then I think we need to focus on that as well uh, because concomitant infection, people could have urine tract infection, people could have any cellulitis and other kind of stuff. So, you know, a good clinical examination of those patients who are uh, having something else need to be treated as usual medical practice. So related question before I go to panelists with this, uh, what is the role do you see of those thermal scans or, or thermal scans or temperature screenings? I think it's a good tool for uh, people to uh, show a couple of things. Number one, seriousness of this disease process. If somebody is symptomatic, as we know, the first thing, uh, more than any other symptom, the fever is the most uh, commonly presented symptom. Uh, so if somebody is symptomatic, uh, and her temperature, that could initiate the process, especially for um, healthcare worker. Uh, if they have some temperature, they should be uh, self-quarantined to see whether some other symptoms are appearing or not. Uh, in uh, population health management, when the disease was spreading uh, on the airport and the entry side of different uh, borders, uh, this thing was implemented. And I think it has a value. Uh, in terms of controlling the spread of the disease in the society uh, and self-monitoring uh, if you are exposed. Any comments from the panelists on fever, fever patterns, thermal scans? Because you see that most of the patients, they are usually asymptomatic initially and the thermal scans, were, uh, they were used at entry points for screening. There were no testing done. So I don't think that it has a, a very good role in the screening because you see when the patients they entered, they were just thermoscanned and those who don't have the temperature, they were sent and it led to the spread of the disease. Yes, uh, but the problem is that uh, um, if you uh, want to uh, control any spread of the disease, you have to have some kind of cutoff thing, some kind of parameter. 
you could not, uh, if somebody is asymptomatic coming from an area where it's a disease process, you could not ban them altogether on the airport. You could not quarantine them. You don't have resources. You don't have test kits. Even if yeah. you don't have test yeah. kits in the hospital. So there is a balance one has to take. And uh, yeah. we learn from our mistake, definitely. And we may come up with something in future which may be more sophisticated. Uh, but this is what we have right now. But how do you have a True, actually. The, um, so I think I totally agree with Kaleem Bai. Uh, but I think one more thing which I want to add on, that's one of the reasons where universal masking, your uh, social isolation, your six feet distance comes in. Uh, yes, those are just the parameters. Okay, we're going to use a thermostat. If you have fever, please stay home because that's 80% of the patients going to present with this most common symptoms. As in medicine, we always say common things are common. So I agree with you. There are pre-symptomatic patients, but that's one of the reasons we're making sure that everyone should wear masks. Everyone should have social isolation. Um, those are the preventive measures. On Great. top of that, thermostat use. Let me take uh, some of the attendees into discussion. I see a raised hand. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and make your comments or question. Hello, I am Dr. Afiz uh, from Karachi. I'm a child specialist. I was uh, uh, worried, worried about ke, how can we decrease the spread when you say ke, the uh, uh, virus is shared in urine. Uh, it was denied by Dr. Kalim, but uh, in urine and in stool. If a uh, patient who are asymptomatic but they are positive, <laughs> if uh, they do not care properly of their urine and stool, for example, in Islam we clean with water, and so that uh, clears our uh, uh, anus area will uh, will clean. Those who do not uh, use water, they use only uh, uh, paper. Stool uh, may remain there, and uh, there may be more uh, infection may be over there. Number two, uh, urine. They do not care about the urine. We, we Muslim use water. So, I, I mean, the last drop of urine which comes, we try to uh, even uh, clear that out huh? by uh, by squeezing the uh, panties from the root and uh, even that drop we also take care. So, if there was virus in the urine, so if the, those, those patients will not care of their own school, their own urine, they will uh, spread uh, virus in the community. Number, three, uh, number two, uh, sore throat. When there is in a, a virus in upper respiratory tract infection, we, as we do in the wazoo, we do gargles, we do uh, cleaning of our nose five times a day. So I think wazoo uh, five times a day and uh, or the Islamic way of taharat will uh, have a lot uh, in preventing the spread of the disease. Or if uh, gargles is uh, with saline, gargles is uh, with saline water. Let me also add a couple of other related questions about the spread as being asked here. One question is that, does the virus spread with normal breathing? Even if the patient is not coughing or sneezing, even if the carrier is not coughing or sneezing, and then how long is this virus surviving on different surfaces? So let's start with you. Uh, it's for me? Yes. Okay. So transmission, so, various routes, survival, normal breathing. So normal breathing or talking, if you are close to six feet uh, distance, uh, normal talking uh, has a chance in terms of uh, spreading the virus to the other person. As far as uh, if you are just passing through uh, from uh, on a street and not come too close, uh, and somebody is uh, having that uh, virus in their body, chances of getting it just by very casual, uh, non-close contact is very, very low. Now, as far as the presence of uh, uh, virus uh, in the other body secretion, uh, they have not seen any uh, viruses uh, in the urine per se. In the stool, yes. Uh, but the World Health Organization and China joint statement about the fecal oral transmission, they said they don't think on the basis of the data that this has played 
any significant role in terms of spreading the disease process. So this is what we know. Now, when it comes to certain practices uh, of different cultures, um, definitely uh, we do the most uh, important uh, procedures uh, and uh, taharat related thing in our uh, society, and which is a good thing. Um, and uh, whether it is playing a role in terms of uh, um, preventing the disease process, it's become a scientific question. And the scientific question could only be answered scientifically by doing the study. In the absence of study, we can speculate, we hope, and we feel, but we cannot make it a scientific statement unless somebody in Pakistan start doing that project and look into those practices in our country and other places and come up with a solution. Dr. Farhan? Gee, I think I totally agree with Kaleem Bhai. Uh, but second thing which I want to tell you that even if it, let's say for a second we presume that there is a fecal transmission, fecal in even if it's a fecal oral, the most important thing is, again, hand hygiene, which Absolutely. everyone is telling you. You have to do hand hygiene. There is a reason. It's, it's what Islam tells you, that your religion tells you, your society tells you. It's completely different what you practice. That's one of the reasons there is the highest amount of fecal oral transmitted disease actually exists in Pakistan, India. And they use the regular taharat or whatever we call the water sanitation. So the most important thing is hand sanitation. You have to use hand sanitation irrespective of where it is coming from. Very good. And then uh, a, a quick comment on how long it survives on different surfaces. If you cough or if you breathe on something uh, and you walk away. Um, some, I think somebody else should be. I, I'm talking too much. <laughs> uh, okay, um, let me call Dr. Morton. Dr. Morton? The virus is, uh, can you hear me? Yes. The viruses uh, tend to survive on uh, different kinds of surfaces for a different uh, time duration. I don't really know the exact number, but it varies between two hours to 12 hours, depending on the uh, porosity of the surface. In plastic, it's supposed to be less. In, um, I think in uh, cardboard, it was a little bit longer. But I don't remember the exact time, but it was between two hours to 12 hours. It's posted online at a number of places. Uh, I, th I think plastic is longer and cardboard is less. If, uh, am I correct, um, Dr. Kaleem? So, uh, rubber so the, the, the study Sorry. which was published in the New England Journal of right. Medicine, that mm -hmm. uh, was looking at the um, presence of the viruses. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And that was, they have shown that uh, mostly uh, but three days or more up to on the surface of the, stu uh, of the steel and the plastic. The cardboard mm -hmm. was kind of relatively low and fabric mm -hmm. was almost similar to that thing. Uh, there was a study done in, uh, um, in, isolate, in a negative pressure room in patients with uh, severe COVID infection and they tested all different uh, areas like switches, knobs, uh, in negative pressure room. Uh, and they have found the viruses there. Again, I think the important thing is, another thing uh, which I want to add, that uh, even after three weeks in uh, Diamond Prince's uh, ship, um, they found the viral uh, element uh, um, on the surface, on some surfaces there. Now, that's the reason when I present my overview, I try to stress that the presence of the viral RNA does not mean that the virus is still infective. And that is something which we will learn hopefully with time, what are the other scientific things which will help us to make a better understanding about this. Oh, somebody has uh, put this uh, very nice thing here. There you go. Um, on the, yeah. uh, share the screen. Yeah. I think yeah. Dr. So, Morton just did that, yeah. Oh, okay, good. 
Very good. So, so uh, a question from audience from Dr. Noman Tariq about uh, again asking some clarification on uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio in COVID infection versus other infections with fever. So, uh, answer to this question, there is a recent meta-analysis published on neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, including six studies. And they also compare neutrophil to CRP ratio uh, in that meta-analysis. And the only thing which it tells us, they never compared the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio between COVID versus non-COVID. They just tell us about neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, lymphocyte ratio, and that actually a bad prognostic indicator, as I believe everyone knows that. But does it tell us that are those patients going to go into shock? Probably yes, because it actually signifies your, your um, cytokine storm. Uh, but I don't remember that or I read anywhere that it actually being compared with COVID versus non-COVID. Very good. So I think we are a little bit over time now, so I'm going to start wrapping it up. And I have an interesting question uh, asked by the audience uh, to try to uh, start wrapping it up. I will probably call uh, opinion from each panelist uh, and starting from the panelists who have not had a much chance to speak. Um, so the question is about uh, how long do we think this uh, lockdown or social distancing will continue in order to fight or, or delay the spread of this COVID-19 infection. So I'm gonna start with uh, uh, Professor Shamsa Humayu and see what her feelings are or experiences are working in Pakistan uh, about uh, the social distancing and how long it might continue. Professor Havayu, please unmute yourself. Um, sorry, I missed your question. <clears throat> so you like the to... or, there was somebody who said, put a question from our audience about how long we think this uh, social distancing lockdowns or partial lockdown will continue uh, to fight this infection uh, in terms of a general sense of feeling among the experts. So what's your sense from working in Pakistan on how long this issue will continue? Ji, mere khayal mein, jaise abhi thoda sa inhon ne lockdown release kiya, to yesterday the number uh, was doubled. So probably, hmm. ye mahina to social distancing to mera khayal ab uh, probably jab tak vaccine nahi aati, we must uh, observe social distancing. Lekin jo lockdown hmm. wagera, wo mera khayal hai, agar ye cases Pakistan and each other thing after this week, probably gradually sorry, geez, and they, these are opened up now. So, Dr. Salim, you're also practicing in Pakistan and uh, Azad Jammu Kashmir. What is your feeling and experience? Yeah, this lockdown is very important because uh, in Azad Jammu and Kashmir, this is our fourth week of lockdown, and here the people are abiding by very good over. Uh, Rules to the Pakistan, there is very tight screening, and we have just almost 48 cases till now. And most of them, they were imported. People came from the uh, UK and from other uh, European countries. And we had very little local transmission here. And mm -hmm. I think if this lockdown is observed, it is very helpful. I watch on television in certain areas of Karachi, you see that there is, uh, in spite of lockdown, uh, that that is not being observed. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Shamsa is mentioning about Lahore, it was uh, easy yesterday. So I think it should be observed. And it is very good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rosina Munir, uh, if you unmute yourself, do you have any comments on this? I think we're having trouble listening to you. You may have a different audio device selected for instead of your microphone in the settings. No, still not coming through. Dr. Kabani. 
Um, well, I think the duration of the lockdown is probably going to be dependent on where, what location you're in. You know, like uh, today in Houston, in, in Texas, they, they've been announcing that they're going to keep the schools closed, but they're going to start opening up the state parks and the businesses. But then in Harris County, where we live in, is the medical center very densely populated. The judge came out and said she is not going to let, lift the lockdown that quickly. So I think it's very location dependent, depending on the density and the number of cases. And the most important part is the testing and possibly testing with antibodies before we really start going uh, you know, economically, yes, absolutely, we need to get back to work. But uh, will we stay uh, at work if if we do it very quickly? Dr. Kaleem, any comment? Well, I think I totally agree with you. Uh, yeah. this, uh, this disease is not just a, a medical and viral disease. This disease has so many different angles and uh, impact on society. So every uh, locality, every uh, country and city, state in Suba, they have to decide on the basis of what kind of number they have, what kind of education they have. As Farhan has mentioned earlier, the important thing is that if, the, if we have to take care of this disease, we have to practice the basic infection prevention protocols. What does it mean? Hand hygiene. And now everybody is advocating wearing the face mask. So looking at the studies, the highest transmission of the disease happen among the household contact. So if you have locked on your businesses ko ban kar diya aapke gareeb jo hai wo bhooke mar rahe hain lekin aap jo hai wo social distancing jo hai apne ghar mein nahi kar rahe hain aap mask nahi pehan rahe hain aap grocery store mein ja kar dusron ko laga rahe hain to one society has to think through all these things the second highest thing which we have observed is uh, in the healthcare provider who are not using ppe or workplace gathering mein and the social contact mein these things have seen. So I think we have learn karna padega ke what kind of balance we have to take so that we can continue to survive as a humanity and also try to prevent ourselves from the disease. Any comments from Dr. Morton or Dr. Pidi? Yes, Narikum. In our institution, uh, we are hearing uh, mixed messages like every place else. Social distancing and uh, lockdown is still in full force. Um, they're expecting the virus to level off for at least a couple of weeks before they will let go of the local, of the local lockdown in here. Farhan? No, I agree with Kaleem. My background is business. Se hai. So I know how much does it hurt the business, my family, back home. Or uh, at the same time, people are protesting outside. But they're not following the social distancing as they should. Or uh, I still believe that it's a very fine balance. It's a very difficult situation. And I just pray that we get over it sooner than later. And um, hopeful that I think the most important thing is that everyone has to take the responsibility individually and uh, and then we can tackle this. Thank you so much, Farhan. And I think we are 15, 16 minutes over our time, like most days. I want to thank Dr. Klee for stepping in and answering questions so well and panelists. And thank you, attendees, for joining us and staying throughout. Please uh, join us as panelists and speaker. Write to us, suggest speakers to us, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.